This 10th year of Daily Tech News show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, DeGracia A. Daniels, Erwin Stur, Ken Hayes, and everybody welcome our brand new patron, Sean. Welcome, Sean. Sean, Woo. you're helping to make Mollywood Fridays happen. On this episode of DTNS, Scott Johnson explains why Summer Games Fest has replaced E3, plus why the EU is threatening to break up Google's ad business, and journalists have to compete with TikTok stars now. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Journalists, get your dancing shoes on. This is the Daily Tech News for June 14th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Grimace, the giant taste bud, I'm Sarah Lane. <laughs> from Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger J. Ah, Sarah outing herself as believing the taste bud theory on Grimace <laughs> from McDonald's. <laughs> you I see. never know. Yeah. You know, I just... I just, just taken uh, aside. I like it. Having, yeah. some having some fun with the studios these days. We have a Grimace-related story in the rundown, ladies and gentlemen. I Indeed hope we, we do. don't have to cut it. Let's uh, get right to things then and start <laughs> with the quick hits. Amazon Web Services, or AWS, is world's biggest cloud computing provider. And during an AMD event this week, Amazon exec Dave Brown said that the company is considering using MI300 AI chips from AMD. Brown told Reuters that the company hasn't made a final decision just yet, but that AWS declined to work with NVIDIA on its DGX cloud offering. Now, AWS has been selling NVIDIA's H100 chip since March, but is part of systems of its own design. Another, another example. Two days in a row, AMD coming for NVIDIA. Interesting to watch. The European Commission has formally complained against Google in a new antitrust filing that Google abused its dominant position in the digital ad market. Google operates ad placement on its own sites, as well as ad exchanges that place ads on other sites. In fact, they operate something in all parts of the advertising chain. In a preliminary opinion, the EC says that the only remedy might be to force Google to sell off parts of its ad business if it's found guilty. That is not yet a recommendation, just a possibility that was raised in the complaint. Google, of course, disagrees with all of this, saying the complaint uh, is bogus because the digital advertising world is a highly competitive sector. Look at Facebook or something. Uh, Google now has a chance to respond to the complaint in writing and request a hearing, which they will do, uh, and which they will then defend themselves and see what happens. Vodafone and C.K. Hutchinson have agreed to merge their U.K. mobile businesses in a deal that, if it goes through, would create the biggest wireless company in the region, if regulators approve it. The deal would have Vodafone owning 51% of the new company. And C.K. Hutchinson, which is based in Hong Kong and operates the Network 3 in the U.K., owning the other 49%. Vodafone would have clearance to acquire the merged ent entity after three years, if at that point the business reaches a value of at least 16.5 pounds, a billion pounds rather, <laughs> not 16.5 pounds, that, that might be, be in cheap, your pocket right, right now. <laughs> yeah, or it's it, kind of the equivalent of 20.9 billion US dollars. That would be including debt as well. The deal is expected to close before the end of 2024. Oh, three and Vodafone merging. Uh, the one, uh, the one, one more down, one, one less com competitor in the UK. Uh, OpenAI released new versions of GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT 4, including a capability called Function Calling. The company explained in a blog post that Function Calling lets developers describe programming functions to the model, GPT 3.5 Turbo or GPT 4, and then have those models create code to execute those functions. That can be used to help create chatbots that answer questions that can call external tools and like check on a database or an API or something, uh, convert natural language into database queries, and pull structured data from text. OpenAI also announced that it's reducing the price. If you've been waiting for the price to go down, here you go. GPT 3.5 Turbo is 25% off for now. Uh, and they reduced the price for the OpenAI text embedding model as well, if you use that. Good news for Pixel Watch users. You can now get an at-a-glance complication on your watch if you choose the rectangular complication slot of the Modular 2 or Modular 3 layouts of the utility watch face. Uh, could also work for a third-party watch face as well. So you choose Allow Assistant to access your calendar, and then you can get day and date with an icon for current weather conditions and temperatures, and will likely be able to do other stuff like show upcoming events with a countdown. 9to5 Google says, hey, 
They weren't able to replicate that just yet, but expect that to work. Also noted that At a Glance was not part of the June 2023 Pixel feature drop, so this appears to be a new little gift. Or maybe mm. it just wasn't ready uh, when, uh, when the announcement Pixel-mas. happened. Pixelmas. All right. Uh, the European Union's European Parliament has passed a draft of a law known as the AI Act. So uh, this is the last thing before it gets reconciled and becomes law. Here are some of the highlights in it. Uh, the act bans the use of AI for predictive policing, real-time biometric ID in public, like facial recognition, emotion recognition for law enforcement, border management, or workplace uses, and it also bans untargeted scraping of images from the internet or closed circuit television to create a facial recognition database. You can't just do the big wide net thing anymore. It categorizes applications by risk as well. So for example, video games and spam filters are in the lowest risk category. Apps that use AI to evaluate your credit risk or decide whether to issue a loan are examples in the highest risk category. And those are where the strictest controls would be applied. Applied. Social media recommender systems, as they call it, uh, were added to the high risk category as well. Uh, if you're in that highest risk, you will have to meet all the requirements for transparency. Uh, so anything about what copyrighted data was used for training, this particularly applies to chatbots like ChatGPT, and requires companies to disclose when content was generated by a machine model. So you have to say if you're giving someone content, hey, we used AI to make this. Uh, it also requires preventions against the generation of illegal, racist, or biased content. In other words, you have to show that you're doing something to try to stop it. EU Competition Chief Margaret Vestager told the BBC, probably the risk of extinction may exist, because they asked her about it, but I think the likelihood is quite small. I think the AI risks are more that people will be discriminated against. The AI Act now heads to the last step, reconciliation. Uh, that's where the European Parliament, the EU Council, and the European Commission all kind of agree on their versions of the draft. Uh, that is usually not a problem. That, that, that means it's 99% going to become law. They just have to figure out how to dot the I's across the T's. Uh, however, that means you probably won't see this come into effect until 2025. So they'll pass the law, maybe the end of this year, maybe the beginning of next year, and then the date it actually goes into effect because they always give a little running time for people to get up to speed and get ready to enforce it, uh, uh, usually around a year. This also comes a day after Ireland's Data Protection Authority put the rollout of Google's chatbot Bard on hold. Uh, the authority said it needed to see details on how Google is protecting user data before they can let that roll out. So not exactly related to this this law, but the kind of thing that would be regulated by this law. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was trying I, to... Oh, go ahead, Scott. No, I was just going to um, throw out there that I I find nothing about this to be a bad idea. I think all of these things are smart. I think that I hope, or at least what I hope anyway, is all the big AI companies, the companies involved in it, the industry at large, adopts a lot of this stuff anyway, these kinds of protections, this kind of thinking around it. And a lot of them are. They've already said, said as much. But... Um, I, I can't, there's really hardly anything here. Usually I look at the European stuff and there's something going on. I go, that's a little overreachy. That seems like maybe that's uh, it's a little too far. I don't feel that way here. I feel like these are, these are practical, smart uh, things that we should probably put in place sooner than later. Uh, and why not have it start in the EU? Let's all be like that. <laughs> I was I, I I'm kind of in your camp. I was I was trying to pick this apart, uh, trying to figure out like okay where where are they going uh, astray with this? And for the most part, this is really great for privacy. Um, you know you know citizen privacy. Where I think the 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 law should it go into law um, might have some issues is things like generation of illegal racist or biased content. Well, le illegal, okay, you know, the law's the law, right? Racist and biased content, especially when it uh, comes to a lot of these these new AI tools, can be in the eye of the beholder a little bit. Um, you know, if, a, if, if, if it runs afoul of law, then that is one thing. Um, if a company... For example, you know, you know, OpenAI says, okay, well, we're working on, you know, you know, bias uh, in our product, and the EU says, well, you're not working well enough, you know, then what happens? So, you know, that's that's kind of where I see this becoming a, a, a potential issue going forward. Otherwise, 
I am with you. I think most of this stuff sounds pretty on point. Yeah, they, the, the the it's it's important to know because that's a really good point that the law will not make it uh, like a findable offense if any illegal content gets generated by accident. What right. they want to see are you are making a good faith effort to implement safeguards in your models that that try to say you know what let's let's reduce the racist content, let's reduce the illegal content, let's let's reduce the chances, not reduce the content, but reduce the chances. I I think it's reasonable to say like look. Uh, these things are going to be unpredictable and sometimes that might still happen as long as you can show you're working on it and putting in safeguards, which both Google and OpenAI have been very upfront about saying they're doing, uh, then it is, it, your point's not as well taken, Sarah, the, the, the devil's in the details. Wh what do you consider bias and what do you consider preventing bias uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is going to be up for debate. And I'm not looking at the actual text of the law yet to tell what that is. Uh, but, but as far as that goes, I do think that 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 can be done reasonably to say like, look, we just need to make sure you're putting in the effort to, to make some guardrails. We don't expect it uh, to be perfect. On the other hand, you could say that about every single part of this. We don't know what the dangers of uh, these these models are. These seem reasonable. They may be entirely ineffective. Mm. They may do nothing to prevent the things because we just don't know. I'm glad on the one hand that we're getting ahead of the issue, right? That we're not waiting for there to be a bunch of damage before we start to talk about the best practices. Uh, on the other hand, it, this may not be enough. And and Vestager even acknowledged that. She's like, look, uh, it's better to do something than not to do anything. So we're going to try this and see how it goes. Yeah, and yeah. and that, that made me feel a little better about that, too. Mm -hmm. Well, this year's Reuters Institute Digital News Report, it's an annual report, uh, shows that when it comes to news content and how we all digest it, more of it than ever is being consumed through platforms like TikTok. That would be over legacy media like a newspaper or an online newspaper or television. Average data across the 46 countries that were surveyed in the annual report show that search and other aggregators have also increased at least slightly over time. Probably not all that surprising. Younger users less likely to go directly to a new site or an app and more likely to use social media for their news. Yeah, let's look at a few of these numbers. Uh, in all age groups, Facebook in particular is declining as a source of news. Facebook itself has been de-emphasizing news, so that probably shouldn't be a shocker. 28% surveyed say they accessed news using Facebook in 2023. That's down from 42% in 2016. TikTok is growing the fastest for news consumption. Uh, it's being used by 44% of 18 to 24 year olds around the world in general, uh, and by 20% of that age group for news, uh, with the heaviest use in parts of Asia, Latin America, and Africa. So, Scott, the article in the conversation about this report says, uh, and I'm going to quote, younger groups expect news to be engaging, participatory, and be available on their terms. That's why they're looking for it on TikTok more often. So now's your opportunity to expel them from your lawn. Uh, do journalists have to compete with celebrities and influencers? Well, this old guy and his lawn are going to surprise some people. Um, I agree with the kids <laughs> on this. I think that um, this genie's out of the bottle. Nobody wants to sit down with the Wall Street Journal in their 20s and go, all right, let's look at the long form uh, version of this story, and I'm not going to be able to interact with it, uh, comment on it, or do anything really much other than read it, consume it, and think about it. Um, I think that is just changed, and it's changed to a degree that there really is no going back. And you you see some traditional news personalities, or I shouldn't call them personalities, uh, journalists who have pivoted pretty well. I think of like Ben Collins, who's got a big social media imprint, just won a big award. Uh, He's controversial in some ways, but he's a news guy who disseminates news, but does it in this way. He gets out in front of it. He does these kinds of videos. They're short form. Uh, they're interactive as much as they can be. And he interacts with his readers, you know, slash fans. I guess we have to call them that now. Um, I think that that's just the way it is. Whether we like it or not is a whole different question. But I do think that if the the traditional news or journalism in general need, wants to compete for the ears and eyes of people today they have to adopt these new methods of doing it 
And if they don't, they will get lost in the shuffle. I mean, it might even be, I'd look at TikTok and think, well, how would I get my news from TikTok? And I guess you can go and do a search and there's an option for, you know, they have categories, one of them's news, so you can look at news stuff. But for the most part, people are flicking through there and getting whatever the algorithm gives them. And sometimes that can be news. You know, I'd be, I'm very curious about the actual day-to-day -day consumption. Like there's more to that story than I think we have here. I think but, a lot of it is search too. Like people right. go like, oh, I heard about a thing. Let me look on TikTok for the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that there, YouTube, you know, is a similar beast and, and is, and certainly had a similar impact early on where people are like, well, I don't want to read an article about it. I'd rather listen to this talking head, explain it because I like that guy and he's funny and he says this and I like his voice or these, there are other factors now other than just reporting truth, a couple of photos and your story's over there's more that people expect. And I just think I use the genie in the bottle uh, example. And I really believe it. I think that's just, that's just where we're at and there's no going back. So it kind of, you know. it, 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 this reminds me of, you know, the term citizen journalism being thrown around. Let's use Twitter as an example, right? Uh, you know, Oh, you know, people are on the ground, you know, do, you know, real time videos, that sort of stuff. Um, that still happens. That happens in a lot of places, you know, but uh, it was sort of eschewed as, well, you know, you, you know, these aren't real journalists. We don't know who these people are. You know, what if they're, you know, there's media manipulation going on because, you know, these aren't trusted sources. Um, I am pretty old school when it comes to the idea of trusted sources. That's just the way that I was taught. The other day, a friend of mine who's in her 50s, but she has a 10-year-old, um, was talking to me about uh, researching something on TikTok. And I was like, well, how do you research like a medical topic on TikTok? And she says, well, you just, you know, use the right keywords and a hundred videos come up and you learn all sorts of things. And uh, she is not the only person who has described that to me. I am still in that like, sounds crazy. <laughs> is this really how we're doing this right now? But at the same time, news organizations can have uh, TikTok accounts. You know, this is, it all feels like the next wave of the citizen journalism thing that could be, uh, you know, an, a, an old, you know, it could be a newspaper outlet. It could be me. It could be you. Um, it could be somebody, you know, who has an agenda, you know, and you have to try to filter that out or at least take that into consideration. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not good news. It's just it's just a new era. No. Wayne's uh, is saying in our chat, anyone else get really annoyed when they can only find videos when you're looking for a how to and not a written article? Sometimes. Yes. And oh my APOC gosh. V uh, responded, yes, all the time. Uh, we just dated ourselves. Yeah, we just absolutely. we like, you know, exactly what demo all four of us, <laughs> all five of us uh, are in because of that, because that doesn't bother a lot of other people. Uh, and and uh -huh. in fact, my wife is one of them. She she looks for stuff on TikTok all the time for answers, recipes and things. She hands me TikTok for recipes. And then I have to sit there and let it loop. And I, I get annoyed because I'm like, why don't I just have written instructions? <laughs> it's just it's just a difference in the way these things are. And when I see the the fights between the publishers and Google and Facebook over paying for new, carrying news, I think y'all are fighting a war that's over. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the there is no law that can force people to go to websites and read the read the content. This is just a new way that people are behaving now, and uh, you you're gonna have to deal with it. You can you can ignore it. Uh, to your own peril, or you can go niche, uh, or you can embrace it. Uh, but but the fact of the matter is, I, I, what this Reuters story is is showing is that this this is the way people are choosing to consume things now, and uh, that doesn't mean we should kill print ver journalism or or that it, you know that we should give up on it. But it is occupying a different portion of the mindset uh, than mm -hmm. it used to. They just have short <laughs> memories. They've forgotten that this this exact same sort of disruption happened when they came around. So just go look at I mean, I'm history. still just to, just to, I mean, not to date myself necessarily, but uh, I think brains process things in lots of different ways. I still, when I want directions and I get into my car, I'm going somewhere I've never been before, I want to see a list of where I turn and on what street. I don't want it to just tell me on the fly. That's fine. And I get that. It's very helpful, you know, but like that, that's just one example of, you know, the, the same sort of person saying like, I don't want a video for a recipe. Just show me the recipe. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's me. Yeah, it doesn't make me right. It's no, just, me it's either. Just, it's just, just, you know, it's just nobody's right or wrong. Wired. I think we yeah. have more options than ever, and that's a better way to look at it. Exactly. Yep. Uh, all right, folks, uh, listen, we have a goal. We want to get Mollywood on the show more often. Uh, I know a lot of you want that. Uh, those of you who are patrons and want that, you're doing the right thing. Uh, but we need to hit 4,000 paid patrons by June 29th to make it happen. That's 28 new patrons a day because uh, we're only 15 days away. So uh, if you've been like, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to do that, now's the time. Make Molly Fridays happen at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Fest took place last week and set some records. So it's no surprise that the fest officially announced it will return in June of 2024. Now, a lot of folks consider this solidifying SGF, as it's known, as the heir apparent to E3. Now, E3 has been a little rocky over the last couple of years. Some people say E3 is gone for good. Scott, explain to the fine folks what Summer Game Fest is and how it differs from E3 or, or, or how it's similar. Well, in a lot of ways, it is similar. Um, and this being the this being kind of the death knell E3 year, where the E3 folks basically said, "Yeah, we're canceling everything," and they did it in relatively short amount of time before the actual event. I think it was only about a month or month and a half ago, something to that effect. Um, and that had a lot of people going, "Well, of course it's it's ending. Nobody wants that anymore." But it turns out we want something. And Jeff Keighley and his people have stepped in and provided not just one, but a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, essentially, this is a two times a year thing, even though they're structured differently. You have Games Fest that just happened, and they have the Game Awards uh, toward the end of the year. And both of them are kind of focused in the same way. One happens to have some awards almost as a side note, but they're both about big reveals and, hey, you didn't heard of this game coming, or we've got a release date for a game you were watching. These kinds of things have now become common at his event, at, at this event. And I say his, he's got a good team working on it now, so it's not like he's doing this out of his basement. Um, but I watched the entire thing top to bottom, and it was good this year. Uh, one thing to remember, though, when you're watching these, part of the reason E3 suffers is because E3 was never really great at figuring out how to properly monetize everything. They charged for booth space. They had other ways of doing it, but the revenue model is a little bit busted. And so when you watch Games Fest, you might feel like you're getting commercialed a little bit, and you are. Like... Jeff Keighley will often show a cool new reveal of a brand new game and then right after that do an ad for, uh, I don't know, DoorDash or something. <laughs> and he did this time. Actually, it was literally a DoorDash commercial in the middle of it. The audience even laughed. Like, it's still, it's a more communal kind of fun way of doing it. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, they're paying bills. They have commercials for Samsung TV or uh, monitors that come on during it. Yeah, it's a show, thing. not a it's conference. A show. Exactly. It's not really a conference. But they get the right points uh, and they hit them hit them well. For example, we hadn't even heard of this new Prince of Persia 2D game called The Lost Crown. We didn't even know it was coming. Uh, so this is a 2D Metroidvania-style game that is very much a throwback to the origins of Prince, Prince of Persia. Some of my fellow oldies will know what that was like. And um, this was the first glimpse we got of that. So that was a big deal. This new Sonic game, which appears to be aimed directly at Sonic purists from the old days and the new, um, and hands-on says that thing's really great. People have been playing it and say it's it's awesome. And again, first time view here, a major company with a major uh, announcement happening only at Game Fest. And it used to be reserved for E3, you know, stage stage moments. Um, this is the this is the show where I found out that John Carpenter, famed horror filmmaker, extraordinaire, mm -hmm. is working on a video game called Toxic Commando, or at least he's involved. We don't quite know how involved, but I assume it's his concept and they ran with it. Um, some sort of zombie shooter thing. But, you know, again, a cool thing uh, to hear about. Nick Cage came out on stage and talked about a game uh, that he's going to be appearing in. He's in Dead by Daylight, which is a already uh, Wait, Nicholas Cage? Quantity. Nicholas not Cage. Nick, not Nick Cage. Yeah, not Nick okay. Cage, sorry. Nicholas Cage. Um, yeah, yeah. He, uh, <laughs> Scott's, he uh, you know, he's he's pretty familiar with Nick Cage. Yeah. So. <laughs> For a second, I thought you meant John Cage. So that's why I had Nicholas. Sure. Or Nick Fury. Who knows where I was going? But, uh but anyway, he came out and was charming and funny, and he's coming up in some DLC. It's kind of a small thing, but a big get to get him on stage. So that was very cool. A bunch of games we already knew about that we're already excited about. More got shown of those, like Space Marine 2 co-op got revealed. I'm super stoked about that. And maybe the biggest get of all, and this is one thing that sets the show apart, nobody else quite has this, with the exception of Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, with their own separate showcases, which they do throughout the year. 
Um, this is easily a follow-up to that, and, and and that was Final Fantasy VII Rebirths. Uh, finally, we got a view, or we knew this was in the making because we've already played the first part of that game. But this follow-up, the part, second part uh, called Rebirth, got shown here. We have footage. We have some story content, some gameplay content. That is a massive, massive get because people are really, really hot on that follow-up. And uh, not since maybe 1990, you know, the, the late 90s with the original Final Fantasy VII have I seen this kind of fervor for that sort of thing. So anyway, a lot of those kinds of announcements and reveals, which is very healthy for an event like this, they also encourage people to co-stream it, which I was very appreciative of. They mm. want you to do that. So they, so they kind of pull out all the stops to make that possible. So bottom line for me is this is an event maybe paired with the Game Awards that have proved uh, individually and together to draw a big audience. They had record-breaking audience this time versus last year. And I think this method of delivery is, you know, we talk about TikTok and how people get their news. This is, this is how we do game news releases industry stuff now this is just how it gets disseminated whether we like it or not the old stage way can still be fun and we can find ways to do it but at the end of the day specials like this are the way it's going to happen and the many in-person events that happen all around the country and the world every year those can keep happening as a as a complement to this not a contrast to this and there's even rumors that jeff Keeley and and and, and crew are considering some kind of physical con Mm -hmm. um, those are rumors only and I've thought a bunch about this and I think it makes perfect sense that they could tie that together no word on that maybe in a year or two but uh, all signs point to this is the way people want to go I think Jeff is is very smart about this sort of thing and is perfectly suited to be sort of the leadership behind it to make it happen and um, I think people should check out you know go look at the archive it was really well produced this year they did a good job well, a small fast food joint you'd probably never heard of, uh, McDonald's. McDonald's. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. It's <laughs> it's. I never heard of it either. I launched a two D retro game, Scott. I thought you'd like this. That's stylized yeah. like a Game Boy Color. You know, the Game Boy that was in color. In celebration of Legacy McDonald's mascot Grimace's. 52nd birthday. Yes, Grimace is 52. McDonald's and Cruel, K-R-O-O-L, toys, embedded it at the website grimacesbirthday.com so you can play it on desktop or mobile. You control Grimace. He's on a skateboard as he searches for his missing friends. He wants to get enough milkshakes for his birthday party. And yes, if you're wondering, there is a ROM, so you can port it to Game Boy emulators as well. Yeah, this is a thing. I played this briefly. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. Like I kind of miss the days of. Is, is it supposed to be anything but fine? Really? I mean, it, it is. You know? But it, what it is is it's a very, it's very it's much nostalgic. like a, hey nineties it's kids. Retro. We were, we yeah. remember yeah. you. And, uh, and Gen Z and even younger are all like into Y two K nineties ish stuff. So I think it's playing on that too. So. Oh, big time! Yeah. I mean, I just bought a brand new little uh, game system that runs old Nintendo Game Boy games, and you know, there's. There's nothing wrong with a little nostalgia. It is just a little weird in 2023 that there's a grimace video game. It's a very <laughs> yes. yeah. What? I I thought the same thing. In fact, I asked a couple of my friends who are just you know more into gaming than I am. I was like, is this cool? And a friend of mine, you know, within like five seconds, sent me an eBay link to an unopened Game Boy Color that's going for like eighteen thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. crazy now of course yeah. if you know if you had one you know in a drawer as a kid and you still have it it's not going to be worth that but i was like no 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 that isn't really my question my question is do we want to play the grimace game and again i don't think that's really the point the point is that it's possible yeah not that it's, it's nice, really the best a game ever grimace revival going on that mcdonald's is leaning into because you don't celebrate his 52nd birthday for no. you know like that's Grimace has has become a meme somehow recently, and I'm not Grimace yeah. is meme material, and he yeah. and he I probably always was, but I feel like now is the time. It's like Shrek and other things. They hit a certain age, and people go, "Oh, let's make this the meme." Nobody's talking about Mary McCheese. Nobody cares about the Fry Guys. Nobody's talking about the yeah. Cam Burglar. We care about Grimace. Where are the, the Fry Guys? Yeah, yeah, where are them? Where are they? Hamburglar. <laughs> Actually, I've heard a little. There's a little bit of Hamburglar rumblings. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, it, you never know uh, how you're, you know, going to gonna strike a nerve. Uh, so uh, Grimace, uh, happy 52nd and to many more. Um, also, thanks to you, Scott Johnson. Whether it's your birthday or not, we are always glad to have you on the show. Let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. 
Well, my big purple life happens over uh, at frogpants.com, <laughs> and in particular, the show called Core, where we are going to talk a lot about what happened at Summer Games Fest, not just that, but Microsoft's big event that happened over the weekend, uh, along with the Starfield demo, and so much more going on right now in games. You can also get status on what happened to Bo, my co-host, who is aiming for hardcore 100 levels in Diablo 4 to get on a statue permanently at Blizzard, and he did it. He was in the top 300. Yeah, amazing. So find out about all of that and all the cool stuff we have to say about the new lineup of games we've been shown this summer over at frogpants.com slash core or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, folks, I hope we have distracted you uh, somewhat from the absence of Reddit in your life as more than 8,500 subreddits are still blacked out. Uh, stick around, patrons, or become a patron and then go get the rest of the episode. Good day, Internet. Uh, that Reddit blackout shows no signs of stopping. And Apollo developer Christian Selig gave an interview to The Verge that answered almost all my questions about why this is happening. Uh, the only one I have left is, why so mad, Steve Huffman? Uh, but we're going to discuss all that. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Don't miss it. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>